meeting on May the 9th, 2023. I'll now call on Will Short, regional clerk, to conduct the roll call. Will. Uh, Councillor Craig. Present. Uh, Councillor Dutchman. Present. Councillor Herb. Present. Councillor Foxton. Present. Councillor Harris. Uh, present. Councillor Huning. Present. Councillor James. Present. Councillor Liggett. Councillor McCabe. Councillor Nowak. Present. Uh, Councillor Shantz. Present. Councillor Williams. Present. Councillor Wolf. Present. Uh, Chair Redmond, Councillor Verbanovic, and Councillor Solomon will be joining us shortly. Thank you. Thank you. people. We acknowledge the enduring presence of the Indigenous people with whom we shared this land today, their achievements and their contributions to our community. Are there any declarations of pecuniary interest? Scanning, seeing none. There are no presentations. Nice to see so many of you this morning. Um, it's my honor to be here today to just share with you some of the things that have happened at Sustainable Waterloo Region over the past year and to give a bit of an update on what's been happening in sustainability in the community. I've been to, I think, every single town and city council um, already, so this is my last presentation, but this is, I think, maybe my favorite because it means the whole region together. Next slide, please. As we were looking back at 2022 and thinking about all the ways that things have changed and we all work in what we now consider to be a new normal. We keep hearing about this new normal thing um, and it means that we are reimagining a lot of what we do and we're reconsidering. And so in the environmental world that of course makes us think of the three R's, re, reduce, reuse and recycle. But did you know that if you actually search the R's of sustainability, you'll, there are seven, eight, nine, ten R's now. Regift, refuse, rot, um, reconsider, um, return. And so we actually looked at it even wider than that. What are the re's that have changed the way that sustainability and this community have changed how we're operating? And so we've done things like re-engage and replenish and reinvigorate. Um, and so really excited to be sharing some of those re's and you'll see that in the year and report that I brought in for all of you to have. I'm also asking that you re-gift that read that year in reports, take a look at it, read it over, and then give it to somebody else. Let them see what's been happening, share it, send them a link to, on our website. That would be great to just spread the news of what's been happening farther and farther. Next slide, please. The statistics you see here are just a few of the statistics from our work in 2022. There's a couple I'd like to highlight. On the right-hand side is the greenhouse gas reductions from the impact network of which the region of Waterloo as a corporation is a member. Um, and the equivalent reductions are actually more than the committed reductions, which we've seen a few years in a row now. Companies and organizations think they can reduce to a certain level, and almost always they can do more than they think they can. And the um, reductions to date for this year are about 20,000 cars off the road. Um, I was here recently with the climate action team and we saw that transportation is our biggest emission sector and so cars off the road is an important thing in this community because it's such a big part of our emissions so we we share that number and I encourage you to look at the rest of the um, of those statistics there they are in the report next slide please I won't go too deeply into climate action because we were just here um, and last night we presented to a council as well. Really happy to be in Wilmot. Um, and what we see now in the work of climate action is the reconsidering and reimagining how we bring together the whole community. The Transform WR strategy is not a strategy of municipalities. It's a strategy of community. It's absolutely everybody's strategy. It's the work of the entire community, every resident, every every business, every organization, every time we decide to go somewhere, Transform WR affects everything we do. And so that work now is to recreate our governance structure and to bring more people into the tent to make that movement a stronger one overall. Next slide, please. 
in the Travel Voice program that we offer in partnership with the region. That's one of the reasons I love being here so much. Um, the Travel Voice program actually had some really great impacts this year. And you know, there's a lot of thinking about, do we still need something like Travel Voice because people are working from home? But transportation is more than just um, work from home versus work in the office. It's giving uh, employees options. It's letting them know that if you use active or public transportation or you carpool if that's available to you, then you are actually a more productive, happier employee and a more connected citizen. And so there are benefits to organizations and the employees. And the numbers on the side of the screen that you see here are just from Bike Month, a few samples of the things that happened uh, to give you a flavor for what we do. And we do go out and engage employees. It's kind of fun. Sometimes we have things like a carpool uh, drive through and people come in if they're carpooling they get a coffee and a donut through the window of their car as they arrive to work in the morning stuff like that it's really fun next slide please the Impact Network, of course, is the program where we help individual organizations reduce their impact on the environment in ways that are measured and that have a good return on investment to their KPIs of the business. Um, we actually have seen a shift in the Impact Network program where instead of having to go out and talk to organizations and say, this is actually good for your business, you should be doing this, not just because it's the right thing to do, but because it's actually very profitable, we are now seeing organizations come to us. We had 12 newer organizations returning members last year and that was in a time when we didn't think it was really appropriate to be going out and actually knocking on doors and asking people to do more in a pandemic world. So we see this shift has really started to happen. Next slide please. Of course, there's the Evolve One building. I hope all of you have been in the Evolve One building, but if you haven't, send me an email. I would be happy to show you around. It is Canada's first net positive multi-tenant office building. It means it generates more energy than it needs. Um, and the numbers you see on this graph show that for four years post-commissioning, it has always generated more than it needs, between 106 and 120 plus percent of the energy. And it's a fully electrified building. And the development industry will sometimes say, well, why would you do that? Because the cost to build is higher, but in fact, if you can break the norm of I only look at capital and I only look at operating and ne'er the two shall meet, if you put them together, remember that net positive energy in an electrified building means there's no utility costs. So a building of 110,000 square feet operates without any operating costs for energy. And so there is a really good return on investment, enough that the building was done within the developer's approved budget. And he intends to do more like that because it's, it's a good business decision. Next slide, please. And finally, the reforestation through our microforest program. And we've planted now six microforests in 2022. We've got three more scheduled or have already been put in in 2023. And we're going to be at 11 this year. Each forest has 100 trees that, get put, that gets put in. And they're put in undevelopable land, either schoolyard corners or parks, uh, corporate spaces, with the idea that it's good for climate adaptation, mitigation, as well as human health and well-being. That's my last slide. Last slide. Uh, thank you so much for your time today. I'm happy to answer questions, um, and to uh, to. And I just want to say thank you for all the support from the council. Uh, it's been an uh, honor to do this work, and actually, this council has been a really strong supporter of sustainability, and it it makes a big difference. So thank you. Okay. Thank you, Tova. Uh, any questions for Tova? Seeing none, thank you very much for your time uh, this morning and uh, for the further information. Appreciate, appreciate that. Thanks so much. Have a great day. Um, <clears throat> consent agenda. If uh, any of you wish to remove an item from the consent agenda, please indicate so now as we will not take actual questions on the consent items unless items are requested to be moved to the regular agenda. Uh, the items listed on the consent agenda will be dealt with in one motion. Are there any items uh, that you wish to have removed from the consent agenda? agenda? Uh, Councillor Deutschman. Yeah, uh, thank you, Chair Harris. Uh, item 6.1.2. Sure, the reserve and reserve fund policy review. Yep. Is... Go ahead, uh, Councillor Deutschman. Just yeah. speak to it now? Sure. Okay, great. Okay, um, so I had to review the report and I thank uh, uh, staff for presenting that. Um, I was just uh, a bit surprised um, that there was a suggestion of, I mean, I see it in my own office, everyone says they're overworked as well and there's uh, lots of things where uh, we're working on, but 
Um, I seem to recall during our budget discussions, uh, certainly the uh, tax stabilization fund was something that we had a lot of questions about. Uh, we were wondering about its use. We were wondering about the levels of the fund. We were wondering if we wanted to move, for example, a million or $2 million to assist in the tax levy, whether there was a concern with that or not. And, and uh, Craig Dyer had indicated that there was some concern. I know recently we asked a question at a meeting uh, about any concerns about the tax stabilization fund and the impression I had was there were no concerns about the level of funding in the tax stabilization fund. So I I'm left with some questions about that. So if staff does not want to do a full review, which I I'm, I'm fine with, I was never really contemplating a full review anyway, it was more to take a look at some of the funds that were more discretionary in nature that we had control over uh, as a council, uh, not anything like development charges or, or uh, any of the things dealing with, for example, water infrastructure or any of those sorts of things. It was more focused on two funds in my mind. One was a review of the tax stabilization fund and whether 15 million was the right amount. And the other was the working fund uh, reserve and whether 10 million was the right amount. Because, you know, this is the, this is the residents of Waterloo Region's money that we have sitting in accounts. And the question is, do we need to keep as much of it or can we give some of it back as we do from time to time in certain situations like we did last council meeting where we put 300 and so much thousand into a fund to assist a, a number of cultural groups uh, in the community. So uh, I would like staff to take a look at those two funds and come back with a report to us whether the amount 15 million for the tax stabilization fund and 10 million for the working fund are the right amount so that when we enter the upcoming budget season, we will have better information as a council to know whether we can use some of those funds to assist the taxpayers of our community. So uh, I'd, I'd like to, uh, uh, if this is what staff is saying, fine. I mean, how can I argue? I'm not, I'm not there on a daily basis to say, okay, what are you doing for your work? So, you know, they're, they're saying it's a lot of work. I appreciate that. And there's, there are a lot of things going on, but maybe we can fine tune it to just two of the reserve funds to take a look at those two funds to see as we enter the tax or the budget planning season, whether there's some flexibility there for us as a council to give some funds back to the community. So uh, I'd like to hear from Mr. Dyer on that. Mr. Dyer, I'll let you uh, address that or answer if you want. <laughs> Uh, well, th uh, th through the chair, maybe um, a couple of comments. The, the first is, um, you know, from, from a staff perspective, it isn't really a question for us of what we want or n do not want to do. That, like, to, to us, that's not the question. We have, as we've indicated in the report, um, a number of uh, significant projects that are underway. The, the, the main point that I was trying to get across uh, through the report was that uh, we do believe a review, a full review of the reserve and reserve fund policy is appropriate at some point during this term of council, but we didn't see it as urgent enough to displace other work in 2023. So it, it is our plan to do a full review. Uh, but that being said, um, we are entirely uh, in the hands of council. And if council believes that either a full or a more targeted review is uh, appropriate at this point, then, uh, then we will absolutely uh, follow that guidance uh, if given by the committee. I have <clears throat> Sue Fox on the docket as well. So Sue, Councillor Fox. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, again, and I say staff are, are doing what council has directed them in the past to do. This is a good time to figure out why these reserves were put in the way they were put in why the amount of money was delegated to them um, and does it meet the need. And also, um, I think this has to be done, uh, Mr. Dyer, before the next budget session so that we know exactly what they were for. Because as new councillors, I'm finding with my own new councillors, they don't understand the reserves or how they're set up or why they're set up. And we have to use the 10-year capital forecast to explain how the reserves cover those things up. But these two reserve funds are a fluid fund. 
and I think they, they at some time had a parameter and a reason for the amounts that put her in them. But I don't know what those, what those reasons are and whether they're appropriate for today's standards. So I think those two definitely have to be looked at, defined or at this council how we see the need for those reserves and, and uh, move forward. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Schantz. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I uh, hear what Councillor Foxton is saying. Um, I, I think at some point in my last two terms, we had a report that outlined reserve funds and how much, uh, what, what the parameters are and, and what the sort of the, the targets are, what they're used for. Um, I wonder if that would be worthwhile sharing uh, with this new council. Or, or, or maybe we didn't. Maybe I'm thinking of our township. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, so, so, so through, through the chair, and I think as we've indicated in the report, we we did do some work uh, over the last couple of years. We can certainly circulate that information to council uh, if that's helpful. Councilor Craig. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I happen to agree with some of the aspects of Kelsey Dwitchman and what he's bringing up. I mean, throughout the whole budget process on a number of occasions, I talked about and mentioned to Council the availability of the rate stabilization fund. I think there's too much money in there. I really do. And so we had a bit of pressure at the last Council meeting to come up with 350 odd thousand dollars. And of course, what did we do? We went right into the rate stabilization fund, which was always available. So I think a review of that fund in particular, it's one of my favorites, uh, I think is necessary. And I think we uh, ought to look at, at it in terms of what its original pr uh, objectives were and where we are today. But I, I don't think there's any question that we can look at these and reduce some of them. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Councilor Deutschman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I think what I'd like to propose is that uh, I have a meeting with Mr. Dyer to take a look at this, uh, see if we can come back with uh, something for Council to consider, because there's, there's time, and see uh, if it's feasible to look at a few of these um, reserve funds more closely. Not, uh, not a full review, but look at some of these reserve funds that we're talking about more closely. And, and, and if Mr. Uh, Dyer's up to a meeting, I'm more than happy, to, as always, to meet with him to... to <laughs> to, to talk about it, and then we'll come back to committee next month uh, and, and talk about it further with more information for council. Uh, Councillor Hewnick. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, I'm just wondering, since Mr. Dyer has indicated that if we do that, um, it would displace other projects, um, what projects might we be displacing by requesting this review so urgently? <laughs> Well, th uh, through, through the chair, if the, um, if the intent of, of council is to have a focused review on uh, those two reserves, um, I suspect that, you know, we can do that and, you know, we, we would do that. I don't imagine that it would displace anything significant. It's a much smaller amount of uh, work and effort and I think we could, uh, we could bring that back. Uh, we could bring that back. I think it would be helpful for staff uh, to get a clear indication from this committee as to uh, what you'd want to see in that report and you know what particular aspects of those two reserves you'd like us to uh, to focus on and we've heard some of that today so that's helpful um, Councillor Foxen uh, thank you and to you chair um, with all due respect Councillor Deutschman I would prefer the discussion to come to this table so that we all know what was the defining thing um, and decide at this table what would be the appropriate thing going forward. I, 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 not to disrespect you in any way, but I, I don't want um, something to come forward with us not working at it as a group, because I find this council very engaging, and I love the different points of views. Yeah, so, thank Mr. You. Chair, just, uh, okay. I just want to clarify. I, I mean, it wasn't to have conversations that weren't before council. It was to focus the scope so that council would have better information on what to look at. That's what we're talking about. Uh, it's not to go through the whole list of the many reserves we have and, and at council and try to decide which ones we want to look at, but look at some in particular. Yeah. And so, that's, that's what I was talking about. I was hoping council would be there to see the whole picture. 
I think I think there's general consensus, uh, Mr. Dyer, uh, uh, to have you and your staff uh, report back um, on the nature of you know this perhaps scope uh, for these two particular areas of, of interest for council. I'm not sure if there was any further. I know Mr. Mm -hmm. Councillor Herb would like to chime in, and Mr. Craig. I don't know if, if with that being, I don't maybe Mr. Dyer, if you want to comment on that uh, first, and then we'll kind of go to the rest. Yes, uh, through the chair, I think based on the discussion this morning, I think I, I think I have a you know a good idea of the questions that uh, that council is looking to see asked in terms of uh, a little bit of history of those two reserves, about the purpose, about the sources and uses of funding, um, how we've used them in the past, how we're proposing to use them in the future. Um, and something about uh, the target balances and whether those target balances are appropriate. Okay, uh, Councillor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I think it was during the last term of council um, that we raised the um, the rate on this tax stabilization fund from seven and a half million to fifteen million, if I'm not mistaken. So that was re reviewed basically in the last term of council, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I, I think. Um, that we, we, as we look at these funds, that it's not piecemeal because my expectation would be that part of our um, AAA credit rating with the various financial institutions are also based on the amount of money that we have in, in reserves funds and so that we, um, we, we look at the whole picture and we're not particularly just picking on individual ones and um, perhaps jeopardize that, um, that rating that might be um, in be put in place and, and be taken away from us. So I, do, I don't want us to um, just pick and choose here that we're able to look at the whole global part. And if we come back with just these two funds, well, I, I guess that's okay, but um, let's remember the bigger picture here. Uh, Mr. Dyer, would you like to comment on that? Yes, thank you. Uh, th through the chair, it's, it's certainly been a consistent message from uh, Moody's during our annual credit rating reviews. Um, uh, two items that they typically comment on with respect to the region is that as compared to our uh, other AAA rated peers that uh, our, our levels of debt are higher than most of our peers and our levels of reserves and reserve funds are lower than most of our peers. Um, and that uh, presents itself in the form of a higher uh, uh, debt to reserve ratio, which we've talked about. Um, I think we provided some information on that back at orientation time, but we can certainly um, you know, update those numbers and, and make that part of, the, uh, a part of the report back. Okay, and uh, Mr. Craig. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, no, I, I, my, I'm particularly interested in the history of this, of these funds, uh, over the last number of years and what they're, and uh, I'm also, uh, uh, and I, I raised the question with council at one point about if in fact we, we went through the whole fund and used it, what other options would we have and so on. I mean, we're not going to go bankrupt by reducing some of these funds. We're not going to get into a lot of trouble. So I think we can at least look at them. And uh, I, I'm certainly interested in the history. That's my main thing. Thank you. Okay. I would like a, a mover and a seconder for um, the consent items, please. Uh, moved by Councillor Foxton, seconded by Councillor James. If you could use your yes or no uh, button to vote in eScribe, that would be great. Okay, and that is carried. I'll now call on Kim Bellissimo, Bellissimo to introduce the report, uh, Strategic Focus Response of a, and Engaging Public Service. Kim. Uh, thank you very much, and through you, Chair. Uh, we're here today to uh, seek approval for the 2023 to 2027 multi-year accessibility plan, fondly known as the MIAP. Uh, I want you to know that it was developed in partnership with the GRAC, um, of which we have members of council part of, as well as members of the community, uh, and informed by customer service, uh, uh, the customer feedback we, uh, we've been receiving. 
Today to uh, present the plan is uh, Amber Sayre. She's our Director of Talent Acquisition and Client Experience. And over to you, Amber. Thank you very much, Kim. So today, uh, next slide, please. Just a quick overview to highlight the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act, so AODA, and a quick overview of the multi-year accessibility plan for 2023 and 2020 to 2027. Next slide. So a bit of a background. Uh, a multi-year accessibility plan is a requirement of the AODA Act and must be updated once, at least once every five years. There's five key accessibility standards within the AODA which are the design for public spaces, customer service, information and communications, employment, and transportation. And there's a Grand River Accessibility Advisory Committee, or GRAC, as we call it, which is a legislative committee of uh, council. So GRAC was formed to help uh, staff identifying, preventing, and removing barriers for people with disabilities uh, in regional services, programs, and facilities. This committee is a requirement of the AODA, and the majority of members must be persons with disabilities. That includes visible and non-visible disabilities and neurodiverse individuals from the community. GRAC is a joint committee across seven local municipalities, which includes the city of Kitchener and Waterloo, the townships of North Dumfries, Wellesley, Wilmot, Woolwich, and the region of Waterloo. And the city of Kitchener is the lead and manages the administration for GRAC. The city of Cambridge has their own advisory committee that they use. Uh, the participating area municipalities also seek the advice of GRAC in matters of accessibility for municipal programs, services, and facilities. So there's often dialogue on ongoing services and programs that we provide. Next slide, please. Thank you. The My App was developed in consultation with GRAC in multiple stages throughout. We brought it forward during the development, such as collecting feedback through discussion exercises and reviewing multiple drafts of the plan. Recently, the MyApp was also brought forward to GRAC again in spring 2023, so that new members that were appointed by council in January 2023 could review and provide input, input into the plan. We also have feedback on regional services on an ongoing and ad hoc basis. So we have ongoing uh, service satisfaction surveys, we have specific engagement opportunities, and we have complaints management processes. We also receive feedback on an ongoing basis through GRAC. All of that feedback helps to inform the plan uh, that you have in front of you today. Next slide, thank you. So the, mul the, the multi-year accessibility plan covers all of the five uh, standards that were identified within the AODA. So those being the design of public spaces, customer service, information and communications, employment and transportation. Some of the key goals include continuing to improve the accessibility of our public spaces, uh, enabled access embed accessibility into our human resource policies, training and support programs for regional staff, and to evolve our client experience framework to embed human-centered design and equity-based principles to support service transformation. So that would look at actually having individuals partner with us from the community to help redesign services to ensure that they're accessible for all. Next slide. So as a next step, we will continue with implementation of the 2023 to 2027 MyApp. Uh, the AODA requires the region to report on progress made on accessibility plans through annual accessibility reports. Those reports are made publicly available and posted on the region's website at the end of each year. Uh, and the reports are also submitted to the Ontario Ministry for Seniors and Accessibility upon request. And that is the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do we have any questions at all? Yeah. Um, Councillor Hunick. Um, thank you, Chair, through you. I have a, a question followed by a comment. Um, why is um, Cambridge, why, or why does Cambridge have their own accessibility committee that is separate from GRAC? Uh, through the chair, I, I'm, I'm, it's unfortunate that the, uh, the Councillor Vermanek isn't here today. It's a historic uh, decision that predates my time in the organization, so I'm, I'm honestly not quite clear on why that is. I think it's because they felt they had uh, independent and unique needs beyond perhaps what the others had. Okay, um, I think for the purposes of 
uh, unity across the region. Maybe we look at that again, or at least figure out what the justification is. But um, thank you so much for this report. And I, I will say that I am honored to serve as a member of GRAC, and I'm pleased to live in a region that's committed to exceeding the standards of the AODA. Um, the, the report that you presented, which I know very well, um, has a lot to say about housing and transportation accessibility, which is really, really important. Those are key areas which many municipalities are currently struggling with. Um, I think in time, we also need to look at things like improving economic development and accessibility in that sphere, as well as employment. But I'm confident that with the commitment of this region, that will come in time. So thank you very much. Seeing no other questions. Uh, oh, sorry, Councillor James. <laughs> Thank you for the presentation. Uh, just a question in terms of uh, the work that GRAC is doing, is there a connection or collaboration with any of our you know, private sector or within some of the um, um, charitable or nonprofit organizations? Is there some overlap there? Like, do you help inform some of the, those, those sectors as well or community partners uh, in the work? Thank you. Through the chair. Uh, GRAC focuses purely on the municipal side. There are individuals who represent community-based organizations that participate in GRAC, but GRAC in and of itself is intended to help inform the municipalities on our, our services, facilities, and programs. Thanks. Councillor Foxton. Uh, thank you. So I had the privilege of sitting on GRAC for uh, eight years, and uh, wonderful groups of individuals. They're from all um, levels of disability. Uh, many of them sit on, on joint committees, so they are sitting on numerous uh, municipal build, uh, committees as well as regional buildings uh, to give uh, the disabled voice. And um, they uh, basically they um, look at accessibility through municipalities in the region. So they a analyzed the ION before it actually opened, and they found deficiencies, and they reported them to uh, this the past council to correct those deficiencies before they were up and completely running. They um, do design, so a lot of municipalities or the region come with their designs for things we're going to build, and GRAC says where they've missed something, and that. So they do a very, very good job, but they're very diverse. It's an amazing group, and amazing to see what they can do, and it was quite an honor to serve with them. Councillor Hunick. In follow-up to um, Councillor Foxton's comments and Councillor James's question, there are consultants that serve on GRAC that can do consult with individual developers and stuff when asked. So that, that is an avenue, a resource that the region has. The re oh, sorry, we'll now move to vote on the recommendation within the report. I'd like a mover, please, for it. Uh, Councillor Wolf, uh, seconded by Councillor Hunick. Please use your yes or no buttons, please. There, I got it. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that is carried. Um, information Council Committee Tracking List uh, 8.1. We'll move to other business. 9.1, Councillor James, notice of motion. We have a notice of motion from Councillor James. Uh, uh, before Councillor James speaks to this motion, is there a seconder to the motion? Councillor Wolf, thank you. Um, perhaps now I'll, I'll ask uh, Councillor James to read her motion and and uh, allow her comments to yeah, do. Thank you. Um, happy to introduce this uh, motion in support of uh, Bill 5, Amendments to the Municipal Act. Uh, uh, it's quite well known. I think there's been, uh, you know, Ontario big city mayors have, have um, endorsed this act, uh, just bringing it to the regional table as well. Um, <laughs> 
to uh, to also endorse and support Bill 5. And yesterday I had the opportunity, I was invited to Queen's Park as, as this bill, there was a press conference for, for support of this bill. And um, I was joined by the mayor of Whitby, Elizabeth Roy, uh, Councillor Bernia Wheaton from Woodstock, uh, Emily McIntosh from the Women of Ontario Say No, um, you know, it, it, this motion and, and what is being asked uh, to change in legislatively is uh, just around, um, you know, harassment and um, stopping harassment and abuse by local leaders. But I think it also works to, um, you know, protect us as counselors as well. They're uh, currently, if um, there is any harassment or um, uh, by local leaders, the maximum penalty is 90 days without pay. Uh, and for um, some of the things we may do, like not filing our, our expenses uh, come election time, we won't be, we, we're not allowed to, to run again. So it's just kind of updating the Municipal Act and, um, uh, you know, having councillors, although we may adhere to workplace harassment policy and, and code of conduct, it's, it's um, really making it consistent throughout municipalities and, you um, what else do I want to say here? Uh, uh, you know, we've we've seen, and I think all of us are aware, well aware of of you know some of the treatment uh, local municipal leaders uh, in you know Barrie, uh, Ottawa as well. Just um, updating our uh, municipal act. It's time. When I first heard about this act. Uh, there were 40 municipalities who had signed on, and as of yesterday, there were over 80. So I think that shows that um, you know there is a need to change, and there's support there. And um, I'm, I'm bringing it to the regional council table, and hope that there'll be support as well, uh, along with the other municipalities, um, to make it. And hopefully, you know, there's amendments to the legislation. So happy to uh, answer any questions or, or have a discussion around this. And I ask for your support. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor James, and I'd imagine you'll get that. Uh, I don't see any other speakers on the list, so we could go right to uh, the vote. It was moved by Councillor James, seconded by Councillor Wolf. If you would use your yes or no button uh, in eScribe, that would be great. I got it. Uh, that is carried. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'll move to item 9.2, uh, Councillor Williams' notice of motion. Uh, we have a notice of motion from Councillor Williams before Councillor Williams speaks to the motion. Is there a seconder to the motion? Councillor Deutschman seconded it. I will now call upon Councillor Williams to introduce the motion, speak to it. Councillor Williams. Thank you. Um, I was just thinking about this a lot because, you know, there have been so many discussions in the media and around council table about transparency and accountability. And sometimes people are losing faith in government. So I thought the way to be really transparent is I know, like, I get a lot of emails and calls about, like, you know, how did you vote? Why did you vote? And it's not re readily available. I mean, I tell them up front and I'm, you know, secure in my decisions that I've been making around the council table. Um, but I just thought it would be really great and kind of help move us forward if we could have that transparency where all of the votes could be recorded all the time instead of always having to put up our hands and do a full, full roll call. Like, it would save a lot of time. But I think it would also be really great for the public because we are so diverse. We have the municipalities and the cities. Um, so it would be nice to see, you know, are we thinking regionally? Are we thinking for our city? How are we making our decisions? And then also even just for my own personal account, like I would like to be accountable to myself to be able to look back and see, you know, how I voted on specific things. So I just thought this would be a great opportunity and a good time since we're starting a new council term still, um, that we could move forward with um, recorded votes. Other levels of government do it as well, so it's not reinventing the wheel, but I think it is a good opportunity at this time. Thank you. Councillor Deutschman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, I, I fully support uh, Councillor Williams' uh, motion. I'm, I'm pleased that she's brought this forward. We obviously have the technology uh, for the recorded vote. I, I was surprised that we had, we were moving to a, a that uh, council was using a roll call style vote for recorded votes uh, when previously it used to be by pushing a, a button to record the vote uh, uh, beforehand. So I, I'm glad that this is moving all of that to that and, and away from this roll call style vote. I, I think it's uh, more equitable when we all 
push the button at the same time uh, to record our vote versus following others uh, uh, when we make that vote. The one thing I would like the clerk to consider, um, and I, I'm not going to ask for an amendment to this motion, but um, where it says that the uh, information recorded in the minutes, obviously, for the public to be able to see how we voted on certain issues, whether there's a way to record that on our website, other than having to search through all the minutes to find those those votes. So it's just something I'd be interested in knowing. Don't need an answer to that now, just down the road to make it easier for people to search to see how we voted, because obviously the whole point of this is to let people know how we voted on, on issues so that they can assess uh, for themselves uh, that way and, and trying to make it as easy as possible to obtain that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Deutschman. Uh, Councillor Foxton. Thank you, uh, Councillor Deutschman, stole my thunder because uh, I believe e scribe can readily handle who voted uh, when we vote every single time. So um, to me, it's no problem. It seems like whenever there's a vote, whether it's recorded or not, the public has on Facebook who voted and how. So, but this just makes it a little easier for them. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Hewenick. Sorry, I didn't realize I was up next. Uh, through you, Chair, I, I think this has been answered, but I'm not sure. Does recording the votes all the time uh, create extra work for staff? And if so, what does that workload look like? And Will has a response. Uh, it, yeah, so uh, you may, everyone might remember during the budget process, we did this actually on a couple of recorded votes in eScribe. There's a button that we just click and then it just means that council does have to be diligent with using, using eScribe to vote on everything. So um, I, usually council is fairly diligent with doing the, <laughs> but not always. So we just ask that that, that is gonna go forward. But yeah, there's a button in eScribe. We click it at the beginning and um, and, then, and then it will show all of the um, councillors who voted in favor or opposed to a motion. So as a follow up to that then, what will happen when some of us, me included, have technical difficulties with eScribe and it doesn't? We will reach out to you with one of our um, clerks to ask you how you are going to vote on it. Okay. Yep. Great. Thanks. Councillor Wolf. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Most of my que questions have been answered, but I was wondering about when you say every vote, there's a lot of our votes that are basically housekeeping, like move into closed, you know, accepted agenda, et cetera. Would those all need to still be recorded votes? Or, I mean, even sometimes we, when we're going into closed or because we've got our computers downstairs, we just put up our hand. Would that so, so still the, be possible? So the way the motion is worded is that all of them will be recorded votes. So you will have to vote on every single item as we ask right now. And then the button in eScribe will generate a list of how each councillor voted on each item. Is there an amendment that would be simple to, to separate? I, I, I like, think you would have to ask the person. Well, I'm not sure how I would even work, how would we, if I wanted to do that, how would I word those kind of motions? which are, I would say, more housekeeping motions. Is that the words you would use? <laughs> With the exception of housekeeping motions? With, I don't know if... I don't know. I, I think you get into a, a little bit of a gray area there with what a housekeeping motion is and what it is. And I think if you're going to do it, you do it on everything or you don't do it on everything. I think it's an all or nothing. But that's my opinion. It's council's discretion what you want to do with it. Okay. All right. Uh, Council okay. Hewnick. Hey, thank you. Councillor Wolf tweaked my brain. Um, what happens in closed? The... The, the same way that we do close right now. Okay, okay, yeah. thank you. Councillor James. Thank you through you, Chair Harris. Uh, just a question in terms of um, other municipalities do this already. Is there any way for uh, staff to look into if there are parameter, if, if it is, you know, across the board or if there is language maybe or, or a process that speaks to kind of what Councillor Wolf is saying. Um, 
uh, with with this, just to see kind of you know what's being done elsewhere, if it is everything or if there um, if there's there's parameters that allow for us to just make those simple motion to go into open or closed. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we could do a scan of that for you. Pardon me. We we could do a scan of that for you and and come back to council and let you know, or send an email and let you know with an update. It would it would just mean that you would either have to defer this motion defer right the now motion. or okay yeah I'll kind of defer to Carrie <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Williams yeah I mean like if people have um, concerns or things that they want to look into a little bit further like maybe even for things that are unanimous just putting unanimous or something like that it, depending on the clerk or the staff of what they think the procedure would be like I would be okay with deferring it until the next meeting. If, if people are in agreement. I guess I'll ask the, uh, Will if that's uh, something that you may be able to bring back prior to the next meeting or give us a timeline as to when this one, if it were to be deferred, could have a bit more information uh, following up on Councillor James's. Yeah, I, I mean, we can circulate a question to uh, a number of municipalities at the uh, lower, uh, at the area municipality and at the regional level and, and see what we get back. Uh, Councillor Schantz. Yeah, I'm, um, I, I don't mind either way which way we go. Um, I guess my question really is, does it really matter if we're doing it online? Uh, like, is it a lot of extra work? Is there extra work involved for those motions? Not, not on the staff level. The extra work involved would be that you wouldn't be able to close eScribe down on like an adjournment motion or something and vote with your hand, we would need people to stay in eScribe and vote on everything. The other side is okay. irrelevant to staff. We just click a button, it all populates it. So that's, it's, it's more on council than it is on staff. So I, from my point of view, I don't need to add to staff's work looking into other ways to do this. Let's, let's just do it and that's on us to pay attention to when we close our <laughs> tablets, right? So, Councillor James, do we want to? Yeah, I'm. I don't want to create any more work for you. I was just conscious of yeah. Councillor Wolf's comments. So, and, and find either way, we can we can vote on this. Okay. So we have a motion that was moved by Councillor Williams, seconded by Councillor Deutschman. Um, so we'll go into that e scribe uh, and and see how the first one goes. I'm using it. So. Not yet. And that is carried. Uh, Will wants to chime in here quickly. Uh, sorry, and just procedurally, uh, uh, when amending the procedural bylaw, this will come back for ratification at our council meeting, and then we'll need 21 days uh, before this actually comes into place because we need to post the change based on the amendment to the procedural bylaws. So everybody knows this won't happen until the June. Um, uh, no, I don't even think that's 21 days, the, the, the June following. council meeting. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, our next meeting will be on June the 2nd, 2023, uh, June 6th, 2023. Uh, we will now start a vote to go into closed session. I uh, do need a mover and a seconder. Councillor James, Councillor Schantz, now we can go vote. And that is carried. We will now head downstairs to the Waterloo County Room. Oh, adjourn. Uh, so we need to do another vote for adjournment? And another vote for adjournment. Uh, please use your nest. Yes. We need a, we need a mover uh, by Councillor Fox and seconded by Councillor Hewinick. And we'll go right to the voting button thing. Hmm. All right, and that's...